for Tony, um, I, I didn't write it down, but your description of um, the current Zionism of Israel, you used the terms also, two of the terms you used was religious messianic. Um, and I'm not sure if, if you just explain what you mean by that, whether you're equating religious with messianic, um, or because my image um, of certainly the religious community in Israel, while part of the people in the settlements certainly are messianic, um, many are not. Um, and the Haredi community is anything but messianic. <laughs> I'm avoiding the question that was asked directly of me. Um, um, uh, um, yeah, I, I have to confess my language is a little bit loose uh, in, in this regard in terms of putting words like religious messianic you know, together. One fills more time, one really does have to separate them out because obviously um, uh, it's not all, it's not all, all I, I'm, for one minute say, you know, it's all religious Jews who are uh, responsible for the size, and because that's simply the case. Um, and, you know, there are obviously very different strains of uh, religious denomination in Israel as there are outside of Israel. Um, I mean, the key thing is that the people originally behind the settlement movement, who, who were the uh, uh, people from the, ch the changing national the religious uh, uh, party, if I'm not mistaken, in LP, um, uh, the, the, the settler movement began very much as, a, uh, as an understanding that 67 was a fulfillment, a sign of fulfillment of the messianic dream. And I think that that is still, um, that is still firing a lot of the, the, those particular, that particular religious really, really segment who, who followed that kind of line, and that is a particular one. It's not Haredi. Um, and obviously it's not secular and it's not, it's not modern orthodox. Um, and I think it really matters that many of the settlers are not uh, either ideologues or, uh, or religious. The fact of the matter is that the settler movement is being, still being driven by, by an ideology or by, 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 by politics and, and an ideology with which certain religious factions are very, very closely related. And that has been very closely, strongly supported by, um, by a very powerful right-wing elements in, uh, in Israeli society. But I think, you know, a lot of discussion can tease out the, these differences because they are um, obviously important. Um, I mean, there was a very good book written by Javier Zarabitsky about um, the you know, Zionist Messianism, a very critical book, and said uh, uh, I mean, all the serious stuff that's been, been written on this. Um, and, but my question relates to the, the, the concept of liberal Zionism that we've been talking about seems to focus on the situation of the occupation in the West Bank. My understanding of liberal Zionism is much broader than that. So it includes things like the role of religion in the state of Israel. It, 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 it talks about the, the situation of, of the rights of Israeli Arabs within the state of Israel, independent of that. And so there's... And, and it also talks about the relationship with the West Bank and, and the occupation, etc. So, if, in, with a broader understanding or concept of liberal Zionism, it seems like we can have a place for the different parts. And then the question may be, what's the priority and where should we be focusing? So, yeah, we should be focusing on building greater equal rights and access to, for Israel to Arabs. So, I guess my question is, are we really, what do we really disagree about? And if we broaden our concept of liberal Zionism, do we have a place for different things? Uh, on the point that, that you raised, Mark, um, it, that we're perhaps talking too narrowly, focusing too narrowly on liberal Zionism and something just to do with the West Bank, and of course it does have all these other elements. I sort of tried to indicate that in my interpretation of the Zionism. I tried in about a half a minute, and then I'm, I'm not to, to refer to some of the other elements of it. And of course, indeed, it seems to me that it is quite in that. But I think we, we, start, we started to talk about those kind of things. And the one you particularly raised, Palestinians in, in Israel. Um, once we were called you know, Arabs in, in Israel. Now, you know, I'm not sure exactly because they call them what they call themselves, Palestinians or Palestinian citizens of Israel. Um, and what to do to give them, you know, to give them more rights? Well, I mean, I put it to you or to everyone um, very strongly. You know, there is no recognition in basically your Declaration of Independence of national rights for for Palestinians. So I would say that fundamentally has to change. That 
I mean, they, they, as they change the constitution, there is no constitution as such in terms of a full written constitution. There was supposed to be a written constitution, um, and a, there was a constitutional convention that was that, that was set up um, you know, a few years after after the, uh, after the state. It met for a while, and then it abandoned its work because they couldn't agree on it. Right? So there should be a constitutional convention where a new constitution is uh, is put in place, which. I would argue should have equal rights for all, and there should be national minority rights, and Palestinians should be recognized as a national, national minority inside Israel, which is what they want now. Do the Zionists want that? I suspect they don't, because uh, you know, that would fundamentally um, question the, the idea of uh, the exclusivity that is involved in the notion of a, of a, of a, of a, of a Jewish state. Um, and you know, it would, I think, bring into question law of return. I don't think you could have a law of return if you had something. Like that. You could change the law of return, but you could change immigration law to, and this is sort of an answer to something that Peter raised earlier uh, about, you know, well, we need to keep Israel because we need somewhere safe for all the Jews that are fleeing Europe today. It's a t separate issue, and which I spoke about last night, actually, that, uh, um, that this notion of anti Semitism and, and, and the state, it's in, with all the exaggeration going on. But the fact of the matter is, you could have a law which privileged both groups. You could say, that you know, in our immigration law, Palestinians and Israelis, but Palestinians and Jews always will have first uh, opportunity to come into, into Israel. But I think you'd have to have a change of constitution, and you'd have to have full equal rights and national rights to this 20% who are who see themselves as a as a national as a national minority. So I think that's a question one goes back to the Islamists. Not I guess I would just say, speaking for myself, I I, I don't I don't see the the two state solution as. Uh, as solving the problem. I don't see it as ending the conflict, uh, and I, I, I see it as a step towards something else. Um, uh, and, and, I, and I think that it would be, um, you know, I think the, the, the way I see it is that, is that the, the problems that Israel has within the Green Line of dealing with its 20% Palestinian citizens uh, cannot be, are made dramatically, dramatically harder to deal with in a context in which those Palestinian citizens of Israel see their cousins living without any basic rights in the West Bank, um, which leads them, which 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 creates even more hostility to the state in among Palestinian citizens than they would have otherwise, and also inclines Jewish Israelis to see them as a fifth column. So I see that one of the virtues of of a, of, a, of of creating a Palestinian state would be that I think it makes dealing with some of the issues inside the Green Line easier, and it's one of the reasons I think one of the reasons I think Benjamin Netanyahu's call for. Palestinians to recognize Israel as a Jewish state is so pernicious is not only that it's an attempt to not have to deal with the refugee issue, which has to be dealt with, um, uh, even though I might not want to deal with it in the same way that, you know, that some Palestinians do, it has to be dealt with, and it's, it's a serious issue for me, which means some, some important statement of Israeli responsibility, um, and I think, for my own preference, would be some, rec some return of refugees, although probably not, 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 uh, not as many as, as, as many Palestinians would want. But I also think it's because what Netanyahu is trying to do by saying Abbas, you have to accept as Israel as a Jewish state, is he wants Abbas to tell, to tell the Palestinians, the citizens of Israel, that once you have your state in the West Bank and Gaza, you have to shut up, uh, and you have, and you, you can't raise any concerns. And I, in that, first of all, Abbas couldn't do that even if he wanted to, right? It wouldn't work. But also, I think it's illegitimate. I think Palestinian citizens of Israel will have legitimate gripes with the structural discrimination they face inside Green Line Israel. But I think those issues will be easier to deal with in a context where you the kind of the the running kind of open sore of the of Israeli control of the West Bank and Gaza is is, is ended. Um, and I think that if you look at the one Israeli Prime Minister recently who has made I think some who made progress towards <coughs> dealing with some of with the concerns of Israel's Palestinian citizens, and that was Yitzhak Rabin between 1992 and 1995. I think it's not it's not a coincidence that he was doing that at a time of some degree of optimism about the possibility of two state solution. It created a climate where I think he was able to move towards things like affirmative action laws and equalizing payments for children between Jews and non-Jews and, and, and moves in the civil service towards bringing more Palestinians in, the kind of thing that Israel would need to do and much more, I think. Um, uh, on the question of um, um, Palestinians recognized as a national minority, that's not an idea that, you know, that I, that I find you know, that, that kind of, that I would be against necessarily. I mean, I think it has to do with, one has to, it has to think, one has to think about what the larger context of the state, of the state evolution would look like, as Anthony said, in a context where you don't have a constitution. On the question of whether there should be two rights of return 
To me, that really goes back to the question of whether you're thinking about a one-state or two-state solution. If you have a Palestinian state that has a Palestinian right of return, then I don't think it's uh, it, it's, mar it, it, it's imperative that the Jewish state also have a Palestinian right of return. Just like I don't think the Palestinian state... <laughs> <laughs> you wanted a soundtrack to the video, right? Right. <laughs> uh, just like I don't think the Palestinian state would be expected to have a, a Jewish right of return. Um, now, the, and, and whether which one is better goes back to ultimately to the question of which one one thinks is more workable. And as I said at the very beginning, I think the two-state solution is more workable because I think, mm. uh, at least I have not been convinced by any of the one-state formulations that I've heard that it can solve what to me is the fundamental, hard, really basic problem, which is basically what does the army, what does the police force of this look like and how do you, can, can this actually be a national identity that supersedes Jewish and Palestinian identities in a situation of great stress? So, um, I'm going to... Mark's yeah, question yeah, about yeah, civil religion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, civil religion and state. I think liberal Zionists are also concerned with um, addressing the theocratic tendencies in Israel, namely that there is no way to be born, get married, or die civilly. You can't go to a justice of the peace. I mean, that's from a North, from a Western liberal perspective, that's weird. That you have to go to your respective um, religious authority to get married. One, now, Shlomo Sand in a recent book where he's crit criticizing the Israeli the Zionist regime and the Israeli state says that that's in order that those kinds of laws are in order to prevent um, mixed marriages, and that's a bit of a um, uh, what's the word a cynical view of that, and that could be true and partly in its motivation. Now, as long as there are separate school systems, we can expect that there will be much less natural mixing then in the melting pot that is America with its dream of, of strong public schools, despite what some parents might say in certain school districts with lack of funding. But the idea is that there is this idea that you melt together, and that's just not the case in Israel. And that's partly the desire of Palestinian citizens of Israel. If they want to be a cultural minority, or if they want to be recognized as a national minority, then certainly they want to maintain, I would assume, their own education system and other modes of transmitting their culture to their children, such that right now they are a national minority. I mean, Everyone has an ID card saying your national status, right? Whether you're a Jew or Palestinian. You can't say Israeli on your ID card, right? The Supreme Court struck that down. Mm -hmm. it, right? doesn't, no. it doesn't uh, give you any rights just because you have an ID card. Okay, so then that is the question. <laughs> then that is the next question. So, so it's a liability rather than a... Than a okay. Yeah. So I'm